Hello, I'm Bishop Daniel Muggenberg, and I'm particularly uh, happy to reflect with you on the gospel reading that you will hear on the second Sunday of Easter when you come to church. Now this passage every year is the same gospel passage, and it's from John chapter 20. We know it as the scene of Jesus entering the upper room where the disciples were hiding in fear and revealing himself to them while offering them the gift of peace. Of course, we then go on to hear of how Thomas was not with them, and Thomas expresses his doubt, but our Lord eventually brings Thomas to faith as well. Now, this gospel passage has all sorts of important themes that are relevant for us as disciples and can inform our Easter experience, but I'd like to reflect on just a few of these themes today. The first is this. Notice that Jesus comes into their midst always on the first day of the week when they are gathered together in the upper room. Now, the first day of the week is, of course, Sunday. And so this is an experience of Jesus in the liturgy, in the Mass. And it's really speaking to us of how we come to experience the risen Lord when we come together on the first day of the week. Jesus comes in our midst and he offers us the gift of peace. He offers us an experience of his presence, certainly through the Blessed Sacrament, but also through the Scriptures. And he sends us on mission. As he says in this gospel passage, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Now that should be an experience that all of us have on the first day of the week when we come to celebrate Mass and experience our Lord in the liturgy. But let's look at some of these elements perhaps in more detail. First, notice how Jesus twice says to his disciples, peace be with you. <clears throat> now that greeting of peace may strike us as being somewhat ordinary because we've heard it so many times. But we need to remember that the last time Jesus saw his disciples uh, was on the cross of Calvary. And he watched them as they fled from him and abandoned him in his moment of suffering, in his greatest moment of desperation and need. His disciples did not act very well. And now Jesus is appearing in their midst. And rather than saying to the disciples, you guys are wretches, <laughs> you know, Jesus instead just says, peace be with you. He has words of reconciliation, words of forgiveness. Jesus is showing us that he desires to restore our relationship more than he desires to punish us. And when we know that about the Lord's mercy, then we will run to his mercy. We will seek his mercy. We will not fear uh, meeting the Lord in our own moments of sin and failure. And the disciples are filled with joy. You know, before they were sorrowful because they had just seen their friend, their Lord crucified. But now that they experience the risen Christ, they are filled with joy. Um, and they're filled with his gift of peace, a peace that is born out of reconciliation. And it's in that moment that Jesus can say to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so I send you. <clears throat> and he shared the Holy Spirit with them by breathing on them. Now, breathing on them is an allusion to the experience of Genesis when Adam was created. And remember that God breathed into the dust of the earth and so created Adam. By Jesus breathing on the disciples, that's a way of Jesus saying to the disciples that they are now a new creation, a spiritual creation, and that they are members of his body and being sent on mission just as the Father sent Jesus. And the mission that Jesus was given was to make God known in the world. And in order for Jesus to make God known in the world, Jesus had to make love known because God is love. And that's why Jesus fulfills and perfects his mission on the cross of Calvary. Because it's only through the self-giving sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that he can reveal God to the world and he can reveal love to the world so that the world might believe. Now, that was Jesus's mission. And now Jesus is saying to his disciples, that is now your mission. 
Go and reveal the love of God to the world so that the world may believe in and through you. But remember that God's love is most perfectly revealed on the cross of Calvary. So the disciples receive this mission, not separate from the mission of Jesus, but a continuation of the mission of Jesus, a participation in the mission of Jesus. And so for us today, we continue to reveal Christ crucified to the world so that the world might believe and come to know and experience God's love through our Lord crucified in our witness. And in that, we continue to celebrate and share the forgiveness of sins uh, that Jesus shared with his disciples and that he empowered his disciples to share with us. What a beautiful ministry. What a beautiful experience of the Lord's day of, of, of peace, of presence, and of mission. But this passage goes on to tell us that Thomas wasn't there when they experienced these great gifts. Thomas was absent. And so he missed out on this revelation of Jesus. So Thomas doesn't believe them. And yet Thomas is still with them. For me, that begs the question, why were you still there? I mean, really, Thomas, if you didn't believe it, then you believe that they were delusional, that they had somehow um, been deceived. And so Thomas, if that's what you believe, why are you still there? You see, Thomas was still with the disciples because he knew that they had been transformed by something. He knew that they had gone from people of fear to becoming people of faith. He knew that they had gone from people deeply immersed in sorrow to people who were filled with joy. <clears throat> that they, were gone, they had gone from people who were distressed, deeply distressed, to people who were at peace. Peace that was born out of a knowledge of reconciliation with God and the presence of Jesus in their lives. Thomas knew that they were transformed even though Thomas didn't believe what they said. And notice that the community of disciples did not tell Thomas to go away because he didn't have their faith, but rather they continued to witness their faith to Thomas in his disbelief. And Thomas continued to be attracted by the hospitality, the welcome, the joy, the transformation of the disciples themselves. Now this is telling us who we need to be as a church because there are many people in our midst who have not experienced the risen Christ. Rather than blaming them or making them feel excluded or putting them down, we need to continue our witness in a hospitable and welcoming way. And most of all, we need to show them what a life transformed by Christ looks like so that they will want to be with us even, even as they struggle with their disbelief. Thomas was blessed with such a community. And I certainly hope that our parishes are communities like that today as well. Eventually, Thomas does come to encounter Jesus himself. You know, we have this, uh, this phrase that says, belonging leads to believing. Well, I, I think there's a problem with that, that phrase. And the problem is that we're missing something in the middle. And what we're missing in the middle is encountering Jesus. Belonging hopefully leads to an encounter of Jesus, which does lead to believing. That's the story of Thomas. Thomas persevered and eventually the Lord came to him as the good shepherd and revealed himself to him. And Thomas responds with the greatest proclamation of faith in John's gospel when he says, my Lord and my God. Now that title, my Lord and my God, um, shows us that the one who was the weakest could become the strongest through the grace of God. And that's the experience of Thomas. And that phrase, my Lord and my God, warrants a little bit of our attention because that phrase is the very phrase that the emperor Domitian claimed for himself. So that when people would greet the emperor Domitian, the, they were required to say, my Lord and my God. So by Thomas using an imperial title, 
and giving it to Jesus, Thomas is making a very radical um, and a very subversive claim. And the claim is this, that Jesus Christ alone is the one who is the Lord of our lives. No earthly ruler can ever claim that of us. No one can demand our obedience. No one can demand our loyalty. No one can demand our submission of heart, mind, and will like Jesus Christ can because he alone is my Lord and my God, no one else. So Thomas makes that great proclamation of faith and certainly so should each of us. Now the gospel passage ends with this very interesting closing phrase saying that Jesus said and did many other things which are not recorded here, but these things are recorded so that we might know that he is the son of God and we might come to faith. Now that raises an interesting question. What about all the other things that Jesus said and did that are not recorded in the Gospels? <clears throat> well, as the saying goes, nature abhors a vacuum. And so there are always people willing to fill in all of those missing details. <clears throat> and we see that today happening anywhere from the History Channel to everywhere else. People are willing to fill in all sorts of things about the life of Jesus, <clears throat> the teaching of Jesus, that are not contained in the Gospels. And many times, these elements are being provided by so-called experts um, that are actually totally unfounded and contrary to our Christian uh, teaching and tradition, consistent tradition. So Christian disciples have to be very careful <clears throat> and very discerning to not let themselves be misled by extraneous things that are being supplied even by so-called experts filling in details of what Jesus said and did. That's where we really rely upon uh, principles of consistency. Namely, um, is it consistent with the Jesus who is revealed to us in the four gospels? Is it consistent with what the apostles taught uh, their churches about Jesus? Is it, cons we call that apostolic tradition or apostolic faith. Is it consistent with the experience of Christianity for the last 2,000 years? If it is not, then we as mature disciples need to reject it. But if it is, then we can allow it to the extent that it remains in conformity of faith. But that's a very important criterion. So be very careful um, as you do uh, hear, um, you know, many representations of Jesus. Um, be very careful and very discerning to be a mature disciple who clearly separates out um, what is foreign to our faith and what is consistent with our faith. Um, but also know the gospels well enough to actually be able to know how Jesus said uh, how he acted, how he interacted with people, and what he did in his life and ministry. Because it's that solid knowledge of Jesus, really coming to know the heart of the Good Shepherd, that fundamentally allows us to discern what is true and what is not true when others make statements about him. So as we reflect on this uh, passage of John chapter 20, let us pray that the Lord will reveal himself to us every single Sunday when we come to Mass and that we can experience the grace that the disciples did on the first day of the week in this passage. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection. As we do so, we pray that you will open our hearts and minds to experience your resurrected life and to receive the mission that you have entrusted to us as members of your body in the world today. May we always be witnesses of transformation uh, that occurs through your gift of life so that the world might be drawn to you through us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God be with you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.